Howdy, it's Kyle talking about Indiana. In this video, I'll be going over various aspects of the geography of the state. I'll be talking about the cities and the urban landscape. I'll be going over the physical geography to include the natural landscape, national parks, and the climate. I'll be going over some of the economic aspects of the state to include the companies that are headquartered there, industries that drive the economy, the tax structure, and agriculture. And I'll also be talking about some of the signature foods of the state. So if you're interested in learning more about the Hoosier State, this is the video for you. Indiana is the smallest state in the Midwest, and it ranks 38th in the country in terms of area. And there are no states west of Indiana that are smaller than it, except for Hawaii. The population of the state is 6.8 million, which ranks at 17th in the country. The population was 6.5 million in 2010, so it's growing, but growing pretty slowly. It was admitted to the Union in 1816, and it became the 19th state in the U.S. The capital is Indianapolis, with a population of about 880,000 people, which makes it the 17th largest city in the country. The metro area has just over 2 million people, which makes it the 35th largest metro in the U.S. And just like the state, the city is growing a little bit, as is the metro area, but the population isn't going down like many other Midwestern cities. Indianapolis is often near the bottom in rankings of the best and worst cities for various things. I've been there several times, and even though it's not one of my favorite big cities in the country, it's not that bad, and I can think of several cities off the top of my head that are a lot worse than Indianapolis. But with it ranking so low in so many categories, it does rank pretty well in one other, and that is the cost of living. It has a below average housing cost, especially compared to other big cities in the country. The downtown is pretty interesting. It's a good spot for walking around. There's a little riverfront area. The state capitol there is pretty cool looking. There's a really cool street right downtown called Georgia Street, which is pedestrian only. There's a lot of outdoor food and beverage stuff. There's concerts sometimes, street performers. So it's a pretty cool part of town for just walking around. And there's a bar right downtown that I love called the Slippery Noodle. I think it's Indiana's oldest bar, but it's a great place to see live blues. The most lively area for nightlife and entertainment is called the Broad Ripple, and that's a few miles north of downtown. So this is where you have a large concentration of bars and restaurants that you can go hopping between them. So it's a little bit reversed from most other big cities in that the main nightlife and entertainment district with all of the funky independent shops and boutiques is the Broad Ripple, which is several miles north of downtown, but right downtown is a suburban style shopping mall called the Circle Center, which has all the typical national chain stores you find in every other mall in the U.S. The city is probably most well known for the Indianapolis 500 auto race, which is held on Memorial Day weekend each year. And this is a huge event that draws hundreds of thousands of people to the city. I'm not very interested in the racing itself, but from a geography standpoint, one thing that's very interesting about the track is that the track itself, as well as a couple of neighborhoods just around it, is a separate jurisdiction. It's literally the town called Speedway, and it's a whole separate area with a different mayor and city council, so it's not part of the city of Indianapolis. And it's also home to the Motorsports Museum and the racing experience, where you can ride around in a real Indy car on the track. And the city is pretty good for having a lot of outdoor type stuff with walking trails and biking trails all throughout the city and the metro area. There's one called the Manon or Monon Trail Greenway, which is a walking and biking trail that goes for about 25 miles from the city, way out to the northern exurbs. You also have the Pleasant Run Trail and the Eagles Creek Trail, which are great for walking and biking. And there's the White River Canoe Trail, which is about 16 miles, and the Fall Creek Canoe Trail, which is about 10 miles. So there are plenty of options to get out there and get some exercise in the outdoors. So overall, I think Indianapolis is okay. Again, it's not one of my favorite big cities, but it also doesn't deserve the bad rap that it often gets. The second largest urban cluster in the state is the northwestern corner of the state, which is actually suburbs to Chicago. There are approximately 650,000 people that live in this part of the state, but those numbers are added to the total population of the Chicago metropolitan area. So this is the part of the state that has Indiana's really small coastline with Lake Michigan. The most famous or maybe infamous city in this area is Gary. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, Gary was the most dangerous city in the country, and even though it had a population of only about 100,000 people, there are like 120 murders a year there. Although there is a really slight uptick in terms of real estate, 
I think you're starting to see some of the hipster type folks moving in there as kind of like you've been seeing in Detroit. So some of the first people to move into these really dilapidated areas are some of these younger white hipster kind of folks. And then once some of these folks start moving in, then the big suits with the new Lexuses start moving in there and start doing real estate speculation. And then that's where the gentrification starts. I'm not saying that's where Gary's going to be going, but because it does sit right along Lake Michigan, right next to a national park, I can see this area becoming gentrified and a lot of people being priced out. The second largest metro area wholly contained within the state is the South Bend Elkhart area in the north central part of the state, which has about 470,000 people or so in the metro area. Now, I have to say that I'm not really a big fan of South Bend. and It is kind of a disappointing city in that there's a huge university there, and usually major college towns are a lot nicer than surrounding cities. But for whatever reason, South Bend doesn't really get that same kind of vibe you get with other major college towns. There was a steady decline in population for about the past 30 to 40 years, but just in the past five years or so, there's been a small increase in the population as a few people are starting to move there. But it is still a very slow population increase. But they do have some pretty cool whitewater rafting right downtown. There aren't that many places in the U.S. where you can do whitewater rafting in the heart of the city, especially in the Midwest. But still, I'd say it's one of my lesser favorite medium-sized cities in the country. The next largest metro area in the state is Fort Wayne, which has a metro area of about 425,000. The city of Fort Wayne is larger than the city of South Bend, but the overall South Bend metro area is larger. And kind of like South Bend, this isn't really a great medium-sized city, and I don't really have a whole lot of great things to say about Fort Wayne. The downtown really isn't very exciting, and this really isn't that kind of a town that's fun, either to live in or visit. But there are some decent walking and paddling trails throughout the area, so you can get some pretty good outdoor recreation going on in the city and just outside of it. But because it is kind of an undesirable medium-sized city to live in in the country, it does have really cheap houses, although the wages are also pretty low. So just like South Bend, this is one of my least favorite medium-sized cities in the country. After Fort Wayne, the next largest metro area in the state is Evansville, which has a metro area of about 350,000 people. It's in the far southwestern corner of the state, right along the Ohio River, which is the border with Kentucky. Some of the suburbs are in Kentucky, so of the 350,000 people in the overall metro area, 300,000 of those are in Indiana. Fortunately, Evansville bucks the trend of medium-sized cities in Indiana. I really like Evansville. I think it's one of the best cities in this size range in the country. The downtown is much more vibrant, has a lot of things going on. It's great for walking and being right there along the river. There's some cool walking trails along the river. And the city isn't entirely dependent on blue collar type stuff. So areas that have been totally manufacturing based have been much more hard hit in the past 40, 50 years or so. But a lot more younger folks have been moving to Evansville, so you have a lot more growth there, and people are just more willing to move there because it is a pretty cool place. And for right now, at least, it's very cheap to live there. Houses are super cheap, and wages are pretty low, but the houses, again, are really cheap. I think younger folks are attracted to Evansville because it is a very scenic part of the state, and once you get to the more rural areas outside of the city, there are some woods and wilderness areas and a lot of cool places to go do some outdoor stuff. It's home to Angel Mounds State Historic Site, which is an ancient town of about a thousand people that was inhabited from about the years 1100 to 1400. And there you can see 13 earthen mounds and hundreds of home sites. So that's pretty cool to see some pretty ancient stuff in the U.S. So again, I like Evansville and I would rank it pretty high in a list of the best small cities in the country. So now I want to discuss some of the physical geography of Indiana, and the state isn't exactly known for having giant mountains and spectacular vistas, but it also isn't anywhere near as ugly as you might be expecting, and there are a couple of pretty cool, unique aspects of the natural landscape. There's one national park in the state, Indiana Dunes National Park. It's located in the northwestern corner of the state, right along Lake Michigan. So it isn't a huge national park or a spot where you're going to go backpacking for a few days, but it is some pretty nice scenery. Although most folks just use it as a regular beach. But it is a pretty cool place to hang out for the day. You can do a couple of short little hikes there, just walk along the dunes. But because this park goes right up to Gary that I was talking about before, I think that's why you might see some more kind of 
gentrification kind of stuff going on in Gary because people can live right next to these dunes and not have to worry about other suburban sprawl and be right along the lake. The entire southern border with Kentucky is the Ohio River, which is one of the most important rivers in the country. The highest point in the state is called Hoosier Hill, which is only 1,257 feet. It's in the eastern central portion of the state, right along the Ohio border. So it's not quite the most exciting high point of all the states. However, southern Indiana, once you get south of Indianapolis, is where it starts to get really pretty. You have the Hoosier National Forest, the Charles Dean Wilderness Area, and a lot of cool state parks and lakes. And the overall scenery is just very pretty. But what might be surprising to a lot of people is that southern Indiana is one of the top places in the country for caving. There are over a thousand caves in Indiana and almost all of them are in the southern half of the state. So in this part of the state you have lots of limestone which leads to karst topography which is the most prevalent type of topography for cave formation. In terms of the climate it's pretty much what you would expect. The spring temperatures are pretty nice, but you can get some pretty severe storms, including quite a few tornadoes. The summers get pretty hot, but not unbearable, but it does get more humid than you might be expecting. And you do get a pretty decent amount of rain in the summertime as well. And just like many other parts of the country, the fall is the nicest time of the year with beautiful temperatures, lower humidity, and less precipitation. And you also have some pretty gorgeous fall foliage. Winters are pretty cold and windy, but not as bad as the western portions of the Midwest. And you get a decent amount of snow, but the northwestern portion of the state, just downwind of Lake Michigan, is where you get the most snow. And that's due to the lake effect. So overall, the climate isn't too extreme in either direction, and it's pretty pleasant for a lot of the year. So now I'd like to discuss some of the economic aspects of Indiana. And like many other Midwestern states, the economy suffered a little bit in the second half of the 20th century as many of the manufacturing jobs went away, but today the economy is a little more diversified and it's been improving through the years. Indiana's GDP is approximately $382 billion, which ranks at 19th in the U.S. Its GDP per capita is approximately $46,000, which ranks at 28th in the U.S., and its household income is approximately $56,000, which is 35th in the U.S. It is one of the poorer states in the Midwest, with Missouri being the only Midwestern state with a lower household income. The number one sector of the economy in Indiana is manufacturing, specifically automotive-related manufacturing. Only Michigan has more automotive manufacturing going on than Indiana. Located within the state are a large Subaru plant, a large Toyota plant, GM full-size pickups are made there, as well as BF Goodrich tires. However, none of those companies are actually headquartered in Indiana, but there are some automotive-related companies that are headquartered there. It's home to Cummins engines, which are big engines found in large pickup trucks, as well as big rigs. It's also home to Thor Industries, which is a large RV company, and it's the parent company for Airstream, Heartland, Jayco, Dutchman, and other RV brands, and all of those are built in Indiana, except for Airstreams, which are built in Ohio. Indiana also ranks number five in the U.S. for pharmaceuticals and medical devices. It's home to the large Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company, which is headquartered in Indianapolis. Bristol Myers Squibb is another major pharmaceutical company, and they have a big plant there, but the company itself is not headquartered in Indiana. It's also home to Zimmer Biomet that makes a lot of medical devices and prosthetics, things like knee, hip, and shoulder joint replacements. Also in Indiana is Guidant Cardiovascular Medical Products. They do defibrillators and pacemakers. Other major companies headquartered in the state include Berry Global, which does plastics packaging for agriculture and other uses. And it's also the corporate headquarters for the Steak and Shake restaurant chain. It's also the number one state for the production of steel, and most of that steel is produced in the parts of the state that are just outside of Chicago. But just like in Pennsylvania, the steel industry in the U.S. is in decline, and there continue to be occasional layoffs. And with all those caves and limestone located in southern Indiana, it's a major player in terms of limestone mining. Indiana also ranks 10th in the U.S. in terms of overall agriculture. It ranks number five in corn, soybeans, and hogs. In terms of taxes, there's a flat income tax of 3.23%, which is fairly low. 
There's a 7% sales tax, which is 24th in the country. And there's a 0.86% property tax, which makes it 28th in the country. So overall, it is a fairly low tax state, but not quite as low as you might think because the income tax rate of 3.23% is for the state. A lot of counties add income tax on top of that, with the average rate being 1.6% on top of the state rate. So when you factor in the county income tax as well, Indiana is overall kind of a middle of the road, maybe slightly below average tax burden state. Next, I want to discuss some of the signature foods of Indiana. And let's be honest, this is the most important category here. It's known for a couple of really good desserts. One is called sugar cream pie, sometimes referred to as Hoosier pie. And it's milk, butter, vanilla, and nutmeg all together. It sounds fantastic. I'm sure it is, although I've never actually had it. Another well-known dessert is persimmon pudding, which is a steamed pudding made from persimmons. I've never had persimmon pudding in Indiana, but I have an aunt in California that makes it, and it's pretty good. Indiana is also the birthplace of the pork tenderloin sandwich, which is basically just a breaded and deep-fried pork chop between two slices of bread. Doesn't get much better than that. And perhaps Indiana's greatest culinary contribution to the U.S. and to the world is popcorn. Archaeologists have found evidence of ancient Mexicans popping corn several thousands of years ago, but it wasn't until the early 20th century when Indiana native Orville Redenbacher really made it mainstream. And he wasn't just the goofy guy in the suspenders and bow tie on TV doing the commercials. He was actually an agricultural scientist. He got a degree in agronomy from Purdue University and developed thousands of hybrids of corn to find the best one for making popcorn. So although he wasn't the first one to be doing this, he was kind of the Henry Ford of popcorn and made it mainstream. So Indiana being home to pork tenderloin sandwiches, sugar cream pie, persimmon pudding, and popcorn, well, it's not exactly one of the most svelte states in the country. So that's my overview of Indiana and I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in stuff like this. I'm usually talking about U.S. geography, sometimes nerdy stuff like this, sometimes travel stuff, a lot of cross-country road tripping kind of stuff. But yeah, check out the channel for more stuff like that. But thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.